That's not what you're saying, but you need to get your finger out my face. Can you come as a webbing boat you without me, Paul? It's all just a part of his plan. If I don't go back with him, it's all gone. What is wrong with you? It's my life, and I'll live it as I see fit. You don't control how I feel. So, it's um, it's more of um, understanding the style, understanding the choices of lenses to use. And how do you how do you understand that? How do you? And welcome to the sit down where we have conversations with creators from across this beautiful motherland of ours. My name is Mark Boy, a filmmaker and an all round story lover. And today we are sitting down with Kago, who is an amazing cinematographer from Nigeria, and he is a multi award winning director as well and a two time African Magic Viewers Choice Award best cinematography nominee we're talking about an experience adventures through documentaries commercials music videos and the film that we're going to talk about today that is up north sit down settle in you don't control how i feel you're reposting papers and if i refuse the question is will you I want to say thank you so much for joining us and thank you for such intimate conversations that we had on the podcast. What an amazing, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Um, when you approach, what's the story behind it? How were you approached? How did you get to, um, to this point? You're, you're going to shoot it. What was that story like before you got on set? Yeah. Upnot is actually a... You see, it has... It's, 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 it's a very funny one as well, too, because we were two cinematographers in Up North, and I had money with the other cinematographer. Yeah. When I was, I'll take you back a little bit. When I was in the film school, yeah. the cinematographer for Up North is called Pindem, Pindem Lot. Mm. He was actually a cinematographer then. Then I didn't know how to handle the camera. So when I was directing, he used to shoot for me. You know, mm-hmm. yes, and when I moved to Lagos, I worked with him as a camera assistant for a couple of times. Wow, you know? so interesting! <laughs> so interesting, so, yeah. I worked with him as a camera, so I used to carry his camera. He would tell me I have to clean the camera, I have to make sure the batteries are charged. So, we had a process, it was it's like an elder brother to me. So, when I got myself, you know, equipped to start shooting and Chopper Oshin called me that I'm go- I was going to be working with Pindem as a second, you know, DP. Yeah. It was like, wow, small world and, you know, yeah. and she, I, I actually shot, Upnot was shot in two parts. Upnot was shot in Lagos and in Baoshi. Yeah. So I was the DP for Lagos yeah. and in Baoshi, we were both GPs in Baoshi together. So when I read the script, I saw that um, it has a lot of um, the story was um, it has a mix mixed culture. They were trying to match two cultures together and try to see how we can you know kind of um, create this sort of synergy with the north and the south. So that was basically and, and it was interesting to me because um, there's this um, sort of um, differences between mm-hmm. the north and the south because of the, the language and the culture and so so it was it was i was really looking forward to it and i've never been to baoshi before so it was it was an experience for me to be shooting there it has beautiful sceneries the the, the 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 landscape and the story and yeah filmmaking so far my process i've never really had that experience as i got in up north most of the times I read about cinematographers, they talk about how they travel, how they, they move from state to another state, shooting, experiencing the landscape, the beauty, the diverse culture. Mm-hmm. And I've never experienced it, but Up North gave me the opportunity. We shot Up North for a long time and uh, we traveled a lot. We, we moved around a lot. So I was like, yes, I'm finally doing it. Yeah. Finally experiencing that, that process. And what's, what's the pre-production process of a cinematographer for a film of such scale? What did you have to go through in the pre-production process? How long did it take? What did you, like, what's the nitty-gritty of what you had to lay down before you went into production? First of all, I, you, we need to understand what the project is about and yeah. what the director's vision is. Yeah. So we took our cue from there. We, we sort of um, check out what colors, production design, and those, you know, those aesthetics we need to 
put in place to be able to capture this this essence of what the, the, the story is about and you know so it's um, it's more of um understanding the style understanding the choices of lenses to use and how do you how do you understand that how do you for someone who's you know who who's trying how do you understand what style how do you understand what lenses how do you understand what camera package how do you how do you do that okay first of all Chopin she the director came up with a look that she wanted yeah. and um as a cinematographer we, we came up with um suggestions on how to capture this you know so Personally, for me, I'm I'm not I can I could work with any camera because I believe it's um, it's about the storytelling and not the camera unless the camera has a specific function to what yeah. we want to do. So we shot with the Red Dragon yeah. and um, with the the set of um, Cook lenses you know, because we wanted to get that that tone that texture that um, that earthy texture which is all over the um, Baoshi landscape, you know. Yeah. So pre-production was, um, I think pre-production was about for about a month where we had to um, come together as a team, the production designer and the costumers and, you know, to discuss that process. I would say it's more of like we have a look and we mm. had a, a team to mm. strike out those things that are not in our in our range and mm. try to to maintain that um, that stand and say okay these are the colors we're going with we're striking out this order of colors shouldn't come into the picture in any way so yeah it was um, one month pre-production and um, lots of recce mm. the other cinematographer they went up north to to check out the locations and why I, I was in Lagos you know mm. trying to check out all the Lagos locations as well. So yeah, it's just the same process of um, you know planning the film, yeah. basically. Like if you're going on Drekki, if you're going on Drekki, what are you looking for as a cinematographer? And you're doing the, all the scenes and you're going around Lagos to find the appropriate scene. What are you looking for from a cinematographer's perspective? It's important to to go for Drekki because it sort of um, prepares you on angles, on um, your lighting setups and so most times you plan off sets and when you get on set, the location doesn't permit you to execute most of those things you plan and you have to start rescheduling your, your concepts or your, your, what you've already envisioned before. So you look out for the texture, you look out for your lighting windows and you, know, you just look out for the space and see how you can adapt to those spaces and check out the you know, your movement and see how you can try to bring those, that scene or the particular play the director wants into, into perspective. So you look out for those things and see how you can get it work out. Was any of this, um, I don't know, I, I, I probably didn't ask Tope this conversation and probably to ask you, was any of this storyboarded or was it more like you arrive on scene, you've already gone through the Reiki, and it's more like trying to capture what you discussed and trying to see what other new thing can come about? Or was it so planned that everything was drawn, every, there was a short list, there was like, was it that detail or there was still some, some room for like discovery and... Yeah. Toko Oshi, for example, she is the kind of director, I've worked with her twice on two projects. She's the kind of director that she's 101% prepared. Yeah on a short list she comes she has she's prepared with a short list but you know when you're shooting a feature sometimes you unless it's um a specific kind of shoot studios and stuff where you can plan all those i don't we didn't do that in up north we didn't plan all the scenes scene by scene we didn't come up with a storyboard but talk about she had a short list you know and most times we because locations are much you have to maybe after the day shoot, you look for the next, you, you already understand what you're shooting the next day and you plan accordingly. And most of the time to improvise in between. So it wasn't like planned page by page, yeah. but Topo she understands and she was prepared for the shot she wanted on how to tell the story. So we, there was lots of improvisation in terms of setup, in terms of movement, but in terms of the emotions she wants to capture and everything, in a scene 
she she already had those ones planned and, and you know and she 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 stuck to it and what's the relationship like between um on a set what's the relationship like between a cinematographer and a director and how do you ensure that uh, you can fully express yourself in that space what kind of relationship do you think works best between a cinematographer and director yeah for my experience you see i have worked with different directors and some directors are very very particular about the framing about the lighting about the camera movement so they are checking you on those things you know some directors don't really bother much they believe in your judgment so they, they focus more on their actors some directors are very technical but some directors are more you know connected to the emotions of the actors so when you understand the director you're working with and understand their sensitivity then you now know how to apply working with them but in the long run the way the way i work you know creativity is egoistic to me from my own observation so and it's 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 always relative too so no idea is completely correct or completely wrong it just depends on how you see it so what i do is i try to know what the director wants i try to understand his style so even though we don't like go planning all the scene by scene mm. i try to understand the style and the psychology of what we are trying to portray in this yeah. film i try to add to the process of what the director is talking about and you know i always like to suggest though i always like to come up with you know one or two suggestions I, I, it's like um i don't like looking at things from one angle mm. so the director is saying let's shoot from this angle and stuff even though yes we'll shoot from this angle i always want to see have you tried looking at this angle to see if it works for you and try to see what you know how we can still achieve the same purpose and most of the time oh yes yes yeah we can go with that or most of the time like no 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 this is what we want to and yes we have to go what we what um the vision is that's yes. how i work with directors and set you will not be welcome in this house until you have completed your NYC in Bauchi. this is not the kind of trip we want to remember I'm kind of documenting my experiences. What are you doing? I want my friends to meet you. You shouldn't have come. And I can't wait for the same breeze that blew you here to blow you back to where you belong to. I don't understand what you're saying, but you need to get your finger out my it's face. Thing, you can also wave me both you without me, but it's all just a part of this plan. If I don't go back with him, it's all gone. What is wrong with you? It's my life, and I'll live it as I see fit. You don't control how I feel. You're reposting papers. And if I refuse? The question is, Will you? Uh, when it comes to lighting, and you know, especially lighting cars that are, I'm assuming the car, the car is moving, and the car is what kind of lighting and that contrast of that backlight and the front light. How, yeah. What did you have to? What did you have to do to be able to achieve that kind of an, an image within that car? Yeah, like this car. Yes, the, the car. I had a. There's a there's a panel battery powered light. Yeah. The highlight you see there from the backlight, yeah. And the the tongue there, that one, yeah. yeah. So I had a had the panel battery powered light diffused on yeah. the back seat of the car. Yeah. Then the other the the tungsten light coming in from outside yeah. was supposed to be twilight for my idea. Yeah. So I had a I had a, a small you know, a small sun gun battery powered light. Yeah. And I had a reflector, a tungsten reflector, yeah. you know, on the window. So I bounced it from the, I bounced that light to the reflector. So it gives us that um, orange feel coming yeah. there like, um, like the sun, you know, the evening setting sun. He, after this guy was just coming back from the airport and he was talking to his girlfriend abroad, yeah. you know, so yeah. That was that was just that was basically the setup. So it's a two lighting setup there. A tungsten light, a, a tungsten light coming from the from the left yeah. and a battery powered um, daylight coming from, from the right. And how do you how do you cut out any reflection from the car? Because I'm assuming he's traveling, the car is moving. How do you cut out the reflection from the windscreen so that 
the image is still crisp and clear. I mean, the one from the back, you mean? No, even we the had front. an ND. Okay, from the front, we had an ND in the back because yeah. the, it was. We didn't shoot this in twilight time. We shot this in, um, in I think, around noon or so. Yeah. So it was it was pretty much hot outside, yeah. and then we had an ND on that window yeah. to cut down the to cut down the exposures coming into the car from the back. Yeah. So that's that's a from back, back. Yeah. So that back should be a little bit, um, yeah. And for like, the front, was this camera rigged outside of the car or is it inside of the car? The camera was rigged on the bonnet of the car from so the how, driver's point of view. How did you clear the glare that can easily um, appear? Okay, we, we use the polarizer of... there. Yeah. We use the polarizer to cut down the reflection because the camera was in the car and we had um, we had like a flag covering mm. the windscreen so you can see through. So you could see that the, the flag was reflecting on the windscreen. Yeah. So the uh, polarizer now took that off, took out the reflection from that from that windows. And when you come to the scene like for him running, I mean most most cinematographers are always afraid of lighting in darkness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you achieve someone how do you achieve that level of um, how do you even see him? How do you even This one was this one was a little bit tricky. Yeah. We shot this scene, I think, about um, 3 a.m. in the night or so. Yeah. So what we did was um, we had a we were seated in the back of a, of a van. Yeah. This was with a steady cam. So the steady cam guy was in the open boot of the car. So he was yeah. seated in the back seat, and yeah. we had two tungsten lamps, you know, rigged to the to the edges of the car. It yeah. has a carrier so yeah. we rig that and then um, yeah so when he's moving and he, he i really commend the actor on this one because he had to meet up with the speed of the car because the car has to it, the car has to move in a certain speed so it doesn't it doesn't jack from the steady cam oh. so he, he, he had to run you know we, the actor insisted we must get this in two takes so it doesn't it doesn't run out of <laughs> of, of energy. And we know. got a car. We got a car behind to move past, so it can give us an, some sort of backlighting. You know? Ah, so that we have yeah. some. So it's not darkness. So it's not, it's not darkness. Yeah, yeah. and we, we couldn't light up the whole street, so we choose the location where we had um, street lights, so that as it's moving, yeah. to give us that illusion of something to just wipe up the frame from the top. So if you look up. Just directly behind him, those yeah. are some tungsten street lamps. Yeah. Right there. Yes. So if you move it, you see that it's it's going past the frame. White cars are moving past and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That was basically what we do there. What do you feel then? Just to wrap up up that conversation. What do you feel like you took from up north? I mean, for the a film of that scale with the budget that it had, what do you feel like you took? What lessons do you feel you took as a cinematographer from this particular project? Yeah. You see, me, my own perspective of life is, like I said, I'm, I'm always look at things from an emotional point of view, you yeah. know. So it was a very hectic shoot, and there was one moment I spotted. I'm trying to still, I'm trying to write about my experience in Up North, So, but there's this particular scene that keeps coming to my mind, which I'm going to start with. Yeah. When we finished the shoot, so we were committing from like a two, three hours journey from location to base camp. You know? And when we finished shooting that night, and we were traveling around 2, 3 a.m. back to our base camp, mm. there was a time when we were, we were moving in the, in the bus, and the bus was dark. Everybody is quiet and mm. reflecting on the journey. And all of a sudden, somebody raised a song. Yeah. And we all started singing and chanting. You wow. know, it was very emotional for me. I turned and looked at my grip. I turned and looked at my camera assistant. I looked at the costumier, the, the, the makeup assistant. The, you know, so we're, it was, everybody was chanting songs of joy. You could feel the stress, you could feel the, the passion, but it looked like we just came back from a war victory. Yeah. You know, so that moment taught me that film is not just only about the creativity. You want to come shoot and 
focus about equanimity is also about the people, the experience, the moment. Because to me, those are the things that you know bring back memory. Those are the things that we take back from the shoots, the, the time you spent with people, the lessons you've learned from them, the emotion, the sour moment, the happy moment. See, that part, that moment made me realize that it's not always about the creativity, but always important to see the emotions in the whole process about the people. That was one thing I learned from Pop Talks, and I've always applied that to every project I've done to. And I don't think there's anything more honestly I can add to that. I think that is the best way to end this this episode and to say thank you so much, Kago, for making time. Thank you for having that conversation with us, sharing your knowledge, your experience. And is there anywhere, and if someone has a question or wants to you know, send a shout out, is there anywhere they can reach you? Yeah, I have my Instagram is at Bishop C. Blunt. Send me a message on Instagram. Send me an inbox. I will reply. I'm always ready to respond. Thank you so much, Kago. I appreciate you. Thank you, Bishop. Have Thank an amazing you very much. Day. Have an amazing yeah. day. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, you can catch a more in-depth conversation that I have with Kago in our podcast. Link in description. See you on the next one.